Coming up, Yvette Running Horse Collin tells us about her team's research on the history of horses in the Americas. And a native-owned digital bank focuses on financial empowerment. Plus, we learn about the next two installations of a new food sovereignty series from Underscore News. I'm Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Amarawahopa, thank you for joining us. We start our newscast in Washington, D.C., where the U.S. government has announced new efforts to record the stories of boarding school survivors. Last week, the Interior Department said it has partnered with the National Endowment for the Humanities. That's to document the oral histories of what happened to the Native children sent to government-run schools. The agency contributed $4 million to the effort that hopes to support research and educational programs. Navajo Nation citizen and any Chair Shelley Lowe says this is important because it will examine a system that was intended to erase native languages and cultures. The Interior Department's second investigative report on the boarding schools is expected by the end of the year. In North Dakota, an important bill protecting Native children is just one governor's signature away from being state law. Last week, the state's legislature passed HB 1536, which requires efforts to be made to place Native children with family or tribal citizens if they are taken into foster care. Backers of the bill say the state law is needed because the federal legislation on the Indian Child Welfare Act is under review by the U.S. Supreme Court. North Dakota is looking to join the 11 other states with protections on this issue. The state's governor, Doug Burgum, has until May 19th to act. He is expected to sign the bill. In Wisconsin, there's a new and handy tool to identify native lands on your iPhone. Drivers using Apple Maps will know when they are traveling through tribal lands or when they are near native landmarks and restaurants. That is because of an upgrade that aims to show the lands of the 11 federally recognized tribes in Wisconsin. They are indicated in a plum color, which will be used worldwide for all territory borders. It also has dual language names for locations and reservations. Apple collaborated with six tribes to customize the new updates. The city of Phoenix in Arizona is adding a new holiday to its list of observances. It was decided in a 7-to-1 vote on April 19th that Indigenous Peoples Day will be celebrated on the second Monday in October every year. All city offices will be closed and city workers will be given paid time off. The city had already been celebrating this holiday for the past seven years instead of Columbus Day. The state of Arizona does not currently recognize Indigenous Peoples Day as a holiday, despite legislation to recognize it being introduced in the past. Last year, Phoenix was a hub for Indigenous Peoples Day celebrations after the art and tech space Cahokia hosted a block party that drew in huge crowds. Native Sounds, Native Voices is a weekly radio show in Lincoln, Nebraska that has been on the air for decades. ICT Shirley Snavy stopped by KZUM for an interview with two of the show's co-hosts. It's time for Native Sounds, Native Voices! It screams indigenous, but it also screams um, that we're excited and you know, the listeners, once they hear that and it kind of builds up, it definitely sets the momentum for the show. And We like to do a lot of variety of everything. Um, we start out with the powwow songs, drum songs, 
um, because, you know, that's our culture. Uh, it's relevant to who we are as people. Um, being a native in Lincoln, Nebraska is uplifting. Um, if you come to Lincoln and don't see as many natives, um, that's because we're all together. It's a very, <laughs> very close-knit community as far as natives go. We all try to support each other and um, attend pretty much anything that's going on through um, the Indian Center or the Lincoln Indian Club. Yeah, so we've had a great, great uh, seven years together and just really staying vibrant, staying in touch with what's going on in the community, Native community, as well as what Native music is out there. One of the main things that we look for is in the music that we choose is something that with positivity and uplifting message. Um, even if it does touch, you know, uh, harsh topics, we still try to make sure that the message behind our show is positive to remind our Native community that we can do good things and we are doing them um, and we can support each other in bigger ways than just hitting a like button. We can actually, you know, help each other and build upon our, our Native people. Native Sounds, Native Voices has listeners from all over the world. You can find it on Thursday mornings on KZUM.org. Those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Horses are a central animal to many indigenous communities, but when and where they came from is a contentious topic. That's why Native researcher Yvette Running Horse Collin has focused on deconstructing the history of horses in the Americas. She and a team of traditional knowledge keepers, professors, and scientists released a recent study on the topic and joins us now virtually with more. Yvette, at a high level, give us an overview of this study and why its findings are important. First of all, this study is very much a first step for us. Um, it was really important to see if we could um, create um, a very high level collaboration to do this work. So pretty much to date, our history, the history of the Americas has been told by other cultures, right? It's been told by the dominant culture. And so if we're there at all, we fit into a European narrative and framework and it doesn't hold us. So some of our knowledge keepers have said that we always had the horse. As Lakota, we always had the horse. And so if you look at any of the textbooks, anything like that, it, uh, it says that, yes, the horses originated in North America, but it went extinct during the last ice age between 11 and 13,000 years ago. And then the Spanish are credited with bringing it back and reintroducing it to our people and the rest of native peoples. So with a little bit of digging, those dates have already changed. Uh, in 2021, they found, um, they found uh, horse, horse uh, DNA in that's about 5,000 years ago in the Yukon. So the study that we did, even though it's limited in scope, it's very much a first step. And we wanted to test that, that theory that we all have to read about in the textbooks. Every student has to read that natives uh, received the horse after the Pueblo revolt in 1680, right? That, that somehow, we, we stole them or we got them. And then from there, we were introduced to that horse. And that's, that's the basis of a lot of the Plains culture. And so we wanted to test that. So with just a little more than a handful of samples, really, uh, we found that we were able to change that date significantly. So at least decades before that, Native people are, are seen with the horse and, you know, feeding the horse veterinary care. It wasn't just a couple of horses that escaped from the Spanish, as usually that's what they'll say. If they find anything with the horse, they'll say, oh, it must have been a Spanish priest, you know, up there with, with a, a single horse. So this study helps to um, put that to rest. 
I'm really curious if you can describe the ways in which this research was done. I was doing some reading and saw that you were able to look at some bones, um, but tell us in more detail how you were able to conduct this research. Yes, and so uh, we had a very um, excellent archeological team, very cross-cultural, which, which, which we love, of course. So we had Lakota archeologist, Pawnee, we had Pueblo, uh, Comanche, helped in this research. And so they actually looked through museum collections. So again, like I said, a, a limited study, but even with this limited study, we were able to change, change the narrative significantly. And so those bones were analyzed as in many different ways, right? Dated, so radiocarbon dated, and that's what bumped the that date uh, significantly higher. Um, we also looked at those samples genomically and that was interesting to look at it from a genetic level. And so something that the world doesn't understand, they're gonna understand, if not now, in the, in the very near future, is natives have science. Indigenous people have science. I know from our Lakota sciences, we have very uh, advanced science as re with regards to genomics and, and DNA. So we have our own analysis on these samples. And right now with this study, the, the normal Western scientific analysis was provided. And we're looking forward to the future to helping to put some of our science behind this as well. So Yvette, it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that through your research, you've able, been able to find in Western science what indigenous people have known for a long time. Yes, absolutely. And the collaboration has been key because we're in this world together. And so far, Native peoples and Indigenous peoples in general have been left out of science. We've been left out of academia unless we fit into the pre-existing narrative. And that needs to change. And so this study is very much uh, what we hope is going to be helping to provide a path forward for other scientific teams that want to do anything like this throughout the sciences, where indigenous and native peoples are not left to the side, they're gonna be part of this and their knowledge is gonna contribute to what is brought forward. We only have about a minute left here, but I am curious what other academics across the world have said in response to this research. Well, I'll be honest with you, I don't, I'm not on social media, <laughs> so I rely on my relatives to tell me what people are saying. But what I have seen is overwhelmingly a positive global response with regard to the power of such collaborations. People were really excited. Other scientific teams were very excited about this. Um, and to be able to help pave a way forward for the future if we want to work together, we need to show successful models of how this is done. And I would say that this study is very much providing that. And like I said, it's a first step for us. And so we're already working on our next steps. Well, we can't wait to hear about those developments. Yvette Running Horse Colin, thank you so much. Thank you so much. A new digital bank has been created by and for Native people. Totem is a mobile bank that is aiming to help Indigenous people feel empowered in accessing their finances. Amber Bucker is the founder of Totem and is here to share more on the app that is set to launch in June. Hi there, Amber. Hi, it's so exciting to be here. Halito, and thanks for having me. So to start, can you explain uh, more about Totem and how you got started? Yeah, so Totem is, as you mentioned, the only digital bank by and for natives. And really the seed for our work was planted years ago in an experience that was really personal that I had um, actually trying to access tribal benefits. So I'm an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and um, was trying to buy my first home. My tribe had a down payment assistance program, but it was really tricky. I found out about it on a fluke. 
um, folks weren't able to help me understand whether I qualified, what the next steps were, who the right person to talk to at the tribe was. Um, it was super confusing. I tried to get help from my bank, um, which was where I thought I would get my first mortgage loan from. And they um, were less than enthused to you know, intercede on my behalf and try to help me figure out how to use this tribal benefit. And ultimately, I actually never able was never was able to use the program. It set my home buying journey back by several years. And I just remembered thinking at the time that if I just had a bank that understood what it is to be native, what these benefits are, um, things could have gone really differently for me. And so that's what myself and my co-founder, Richard Chance, have set out to do is to create a bank that can bridge the gap between Native people and their personal finances and their tribe and their resources that are available to them um, through both tribal and national benefit programs. So um, that's what we've set out to do. Totem is a digital bank. Uh, what is the difference between that uh, versus a traditional bank? A digital bank basically just means that we don't have branches. So there's not a, a branch footprint where you can walk in and talk to a teller. But, um, you know, that's OK for us, because the reason that we built a digital first solution was actually in response to the needs of indigenous people. Um, we travel three times further on average to get to a bank branch than average Americans. And so the opportunity that we have with technology, particularly mobile technology, technology and applications and people becoming more familiar with and comfortable with um, fintech or financial technology, that gives us the opportunity to create a best in class tech forward solution designed specifically for our people so that it doesn't matter whether you live on a remote reservation or a rural area or if you're an urban native, you can have access to the same quality financial products that anyone else can have. And so really the the power of technology is, um, you know, uh, un unbounding us from some of those physical structures while still giving us the resources to bank in the ways that we need to. So, for example, um, we know that we're going to be banking a lot of first time bankers. Um, natives are one of the largest groups of unbanked people in the nation. That's for a lot of reasons that we're helping to address with our technology. Um, but working with those people that are, are just becoming banked for the first time, we're able to give them the opportunity to load cash at retail locations like Target, Walgreens, CVS. We have surcharge free ATMs to make sure that you can access your funds from anywhere um, and are really doing a lot to make sure that you have both virtual and physical access to your money anytime. I'm really curious. I have a lot of aunts and relatives who say, oh, I don't want to download a mobile app on my phone because there isn't a lot of trust versus going into a teller and knowing where your money is going. What is your response to those people who might just need a little bit of push to say this is safe and it is a good idea? Yeah, so we use bank level encryption and security um, in our app. We use best in class financial products and partners like Galileo, which is a major payment processor. Visa is the rails that we run on. All of these companies, you know, AWS is, you know, what, what a lot of our tech stack is built on to Amazon. Um, all of these companies are held to the absolute highest standards when it comes to security. And we maintain all of those same, um, you know, compliance and fraud uh, protections that any other, actually we, we maintain a lot of better protections than you might get in a typical small community institution because we don't have that overhead from branches. So we're able to invest in advanced technology um, such as our fraud detection provider, which can measure everything from, you know, how someone is holding their phone to the velocity of transactions to help us make sure that our people and our accounts are safe and secure. I'd love to learn more about the name of your bank, Totem. How did that come to be? So it's interesting because I'm Choctaw. My co-founder, Richard, is Cherokee. And so neither one of us belong to Totem Carving Cultures. And so we do get questions about that, the name a lot. And where that came from is really based in our desire to help craft the narrative about our people and our relationship with money. So no matter where you go globally, totems are part of many cultures. And the thing that they do, no matter where they are, is they tell the story of the people that they represent. 
So there's this really toxic and pervasive narrative about natives and our relationship with money that's just kind of out there in the world. We all know some of those hurtful things, and I don't have to repeat them for for our audience. But um, you know, people don't think that we people don't think of native folks as um, wealthy people or people of prosperity, and um, we are. It's just it looks a little different than it does in the dominant colonizer culture. Um, you know, we're very entrepreneurial people. We're gifting is such an important part of our culture and generosity and making sure that we're taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. So, you know, an example there is we have free uh, person to person transfers to other totem members. So for your auntie, if you ever needed to send her some cash, you know, to to pay her back for something or help her pay a bill, um, if she's a part of the totem community, you can do that for free. Well, Amber, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Our friends at Underscore News have published a new series called Flexing Food Sovereignty. It is a seven-story series that shares how cultural knowledge and practices sustain Native people through traditional foods. We are back with Nicole Charlie, who is the co-manager of the project. Hi, Nicole. Hey, thanks again for having me. Last week, we talked about the first four installments of Flexing Food Sovereignty. I want to move to the fifth article called How Acorns Carry Cultural Knowledge, which was written by Jessica Douglas. Tell us about the acorn camps. Yes, Jessica Douglas uh, is part of the Oregon tribal community, uh, specifically Siletz and Grand Ronde. And she had firsthand experience with uh, revitalization of gathering acorns um, and preparing it for a meal with her community. And what was so special is um, the relationships they build with communities around them to be able to harvest the acorns. And for the communities to come together, the two tribal communities to come together and learn together um, from elders sharing their memories <clears throat> to young families and young children to have that hands-on experience with, with the living plants, with the living trees, um, and to prepare it from beginning to end where they're able to share a meal is so special and something they do annually. And for me, it really uh, rang true and makes me happy because for tribal people to re-engage with, with their foods, with their history, with their culture is really special. And that's the same way, you know, we teach our children and in our family is to engage with plant identification, with hands-on in the dirt, in the soil, with the living being and uh, preparing it from start to finish is core memory building for them to be able to, to keep for themselves and to share forward for future generations. The next article uh, is called When Food is Much More Than a Commodity by Jacqueline De La Harp. Give us a high level overview mm -hmm. about that story. Sure, I think a lot of tribal communities have uh, intimate knowledge of, of commodity foods. Um, you see it now more in pop culture with uh, companies with t-shirts and stickers and um, the federal program FDIPR um, is really unique for tribal communities and the history of commodities for tribal nations engaging with the U.S. government and in initial treaty processes is still seen today in food programs. Um, there's close relationships with tribal nations and USDA. And um, now in 2023, the work I do on a daily basis with in a tribal agriculture council, there's a big push for the new farm bill that will hopefully be coming out and language um, that makes it easier for tribal nations to have more sovereignty over their food systems to address food insecurities um, and for food producers 
that are native to be able to participate in more programs and to have more red tape uh, cleared to be able to engage more in food systems regionally, nationally, and across the world. We only have about a minute left here, Nicole, but I am curious now that we've gone through the entire Flexing Food Sovereignty series at a high level, what do you hope that our viewers take away from this project? For me, I love that it's getting wide exposure about food systems and tribal communities um, from rural communities, tribal nations, uh, people living in urban areas and how we're engaging with our food and we're being really mindful of uh, our natural resources, which are sacred resources and our food resources and uh, for people to engage more. I encourage people to engage more with their traditional foods and um, be mindful of, of what we're taking into ourselves and what we're uh, protecting and leaving for our children and future generations. Well, Nicole, Charlie, we thank you so much for all you've shared with us. Thank you. The full series of Flexing Food Sovereignty can be found online at underscore news. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.